Good afternoon or good morning as the case may be if you're in, in Western Australia. Um, I'm Simon Jackman, a Professor of Political Science and Chief Executive Officer of the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney. Uh, welcome back uh, to uh, 2021 series of webinars. Um, this year, this is our monthly chat that uh, my counterpart Gordon Flake at the Perth US Asia Center uh, and I do, uh, through 2020, we were doing these monthly. We've decided to continue them into 2021 as there's so much to talk about and analyze for Australian audiences coming out of the United States. This year, by mutual agreement, Gordon and I will be spending a little less time, obviously the election's behind us and, it's, and, and policy um, is going to be at least if we can ha, as be a, a bigger focus uh, for us in our monthly conversations this year. But without a guest today, we thought kicking off that there'd be enough for us to talk about. And of course, you know, the deck chairs are being hastily rearranged in, in, in Washington uh, as, as we speak. So it's, it'll be just Gordon and I today, but thank you to the, to the 400 um, people uh, that signed up in advance uh, for today's event. Um, those numbers, by the way, are uh, indicative of the intense levels of interest uh, in what's happening in Washington as we transition to a, a new administration and trying to understand what the new administration and its policies, uh, and indeed the politics that are happening in Washington right now, what they all might mean uh, for Australia. Um, we, as is customary, let me, uh, acknowledge the fact that the United States Study Center uh, stands on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people, part of the Eora Nation there in Sydney. I'm actually in Brisbane today, um, combining a bit of work with a bit of uh, family catch up now that the, uh, the, the borders are open. So these are not my usual work surrounds uh, today. And, and Gordon Flake joins us from the University of Western Australia. Hello, Gordon. Simon, looking forward to this conversation, joining you from the, the lands of the, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation here in Western Australia. So let me extend our respect to their elders past, present and emerging as well. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, great to have this series up and running again. Uh, this, but let's, let's get right in there. We've got one hour and there's, and there's a lot to get through. So Gordon, first question to you, look, I mean, we have to start here, and we, we, we said we would ahead of the call today, but January 6, um, 2021, it's one of those dates that has been immediately seared, I think, into our, into our consciousness um, about American politics and, and American history. I, I wonder, Gordon, if, you know, your reflections on, on the day, perhaps, some of the events and how it unfolded and and, and the reaction of a the president, but then people around him, um, and 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 of course it sets us up for the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump that I think hangs over this new Congress and frankly sort of American politics at the moment and until I think that is out of the way. Uh, it's you know we have to address it as the Congress feels they have to address the events of January six. Uh, but Gordon, your reflections on the day and in particular, perhaps pivoting to what it implies, you know, politics and the policy climate in the Congress, perhaps in particular right now. Well, thank you, Simon. I, I appreciate your, your use of the word seared um, because it really is seared on, on my memory. I'm not of the age that I remember when, when JFK was shot, uh, but obviously for me, you know, the shooting of Ronald Reagan, uh, the, the loss of the space that are subtle challenger, there, there are a few key events where you remember exactly where you were, uh, and this will always be one of those. I had gone to bed uh, the night of the 6th of January here in Australia after having had a long conversation uh, with several of, of uh, my fellow kind of political junkies here in Western Australia. We have a governor, uh, Kim Beasley, uh, and a former foreign minister, Defense Minister Stephen Smith, uh, who had spent the evening talking about the election results in the special election in Georgia. It's easy to remember that something yeah. historic also happened on that day with the state of Georgia had elected for the first time ever in a special election, uh, its first African-American center. 
Uh, and we went to bed that evening quite optimistic because the polls showed that it was very likely that they had also returned a full Democratic ticket uh, in the first ever Jewish American senator. So I woke up the morning of the 7th here, which would have been mid-afternoon, late evening, or early evening of the 6th in Washington, D.C., and quickly jumped on Twitter because I wanted to find out what I thought would be good news about the special elections in Georgia, uh, and, and then immediately encountered these searing images of an insurrection, uh, of an attack on, on the U.S. Capitol. Uh, and for our Australian viewers, it, it's hard to explain. You know, I, I never worked on Capitol Hill, but I spent 25 years in Washington, D.C. Uh, and when Americans talk about uh, the Capitol as being the, a temple of democracy, there is an element of, 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 of hallowed ground, uh, of sacredness about that. Uh, and, and it hit me. Uh, it, just, it was just shocking to me to see violence in the capital, death in the capital, uh, you know, the, the desecration uh, of that cradle of democracy. Uh, and so I was, <laughs> I was it, it, it is a pretty rough way for the next 48 hours as this played out. Uh, I was deeply encouraged uh, by the decision of congressional leaders to immediately, once the capital had been secured uh, and, and, re-secure, and re-secured and cleaned out, to come back and carry out their constitutional duties. Uh, and it's important to remember that despite all the chaos, in the end, the, the systems of democracy work. Uh, in each and every state, many of them with Republican governors and legislatures, the, the votes were certified. Uh, they were duly counted uh, by the Congress on the 6th of, 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 of January. Uh, and, and a few weeks later, just two weeks later, we saw you know, a polar opposite image of the U.S. Capitol the pomp and, circu- uh, pomp and circumstance of, the, of, the, the, of the, the inauguration itself with beautiful poetry and, 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 and all the, the, the pageantry and, and uh, dignity that the United States could muster, a sharp juxtaposition. Um, but obviously, things that are that serious can't just be ignored. Uh, and that is at the crux of what's happening in Washington, D.C. this week. And it's at the crux of um, what's going to happen next week as, as we start the second impeachment trial of now former President Donald J. Trump. Uh, so, again, the things that I'd welcome your reaction to as well. Obviously, you know, we had a, a vote on the House today uh, to, to re- strip uh, a highly controversial Congresswoman, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, of her committee assignments, given her support, not just for the insurrection, but a whole range of QAnon, conspiracy theories, purporting violence, et cetera. Uh, You also had yesterday a a secret vote by the Republicans to remove Liz Cheney, the third ranking Republican in the House from a position which failed in a secret ballot. Uh, And you've had ongoing Republican efforts to censure members of that party who have supported Donald Trump in this process. And so it's, it's a very active and ongoing battle for the soul of the Republican party uh, and thus uh, something that impacts the United States, but that's the context in which the impeachment you raised um, is taking place next week. So a lot there. Uh, I welcome some of your reactions as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Go- Thanks, Gordon. Look, um, real quickly, um, I think you encapsulated it well. Um, um, my reaction as well, just aghast. Um, but on the other hand, and Gordon, I want to ask you this. I wish I could say I was totally surprised and I was shocked, but not surprised. It's a hard, maybe there's a word in German for that. Um, <laughs> Probably a very long one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but um, how could it have ended differently given what the president and people around him were saying? There was no compromise. There was never any, in, in the face of court case after court case, just this sticking to their guns about the election being stolen. We, I won in a landslide. Everybody knows it. You know it. Um, um, what? How was that going to end? Um, um, uh, you know, uh, the phone call leaning so hard on these Republican, in some cases, local level election officials in Michigan and Georgia, state level in Georgia. We know about those. Uh, and then the rally itself, just what was, 
And what did they think Pence could do or would do? And I just had this, as I was watching it, part of me was, it was the, the exact form of it, obviously, you, you can't foresee that, or I didn't, but, but I'm just wondering, Gordon, your thoughts on that sort of the arc that, that perhaps got us there, particularly through the post-election period, but perhaps going earlier as well, the way I think, you know, we'll get into the GOP's issues in a moment, um, but the way I think we've been set up for this for a long time, frankly, um, um, oh. the presidents, the presidents, as I, I think I said in print somewhere, um, at best a cavalier attitude to the way, to the use of violence or, or encouraging or references to violence, um, sort of a casual cavalier attitude to, to violence in the service of, of, of political aims and ambitions. Now, you, you framed it very well, uh, and, and that actually frames the ongoing challenge for the Biden administration and for the United States. And to get a sense for scale, uh, I, I referenced very briefly uh, the fact that uh, the, the third ranking Republican in the House of Representatives voted uh, in the House to impeach the president, right? One of only a handful of Republicans that did so. Uh, and that has led to some, some this is the, the daughter of former Vice President uh, Dick Cheney. Um, that has led to particular ire among the Trump wing of the party against her. So Matt Gates, a congressman from Florida, who's a you know well known and particularly vocal Trumpist, flew the day before yesterday to her home state of Wyoming to, to lead a rally on the steps of the Wyoming Capitol against a you know, fellow Republican congresswoman, one of his leaders, uh, and they all predicted uh, that she would be removed from her leadership post. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader, uh, the minority leader in the House, made the decision to have a secret ballot. Uh, and remarkably, in that secret ballot, uh, you know, it was basically two thirds to one third, um, uh, you know, against removing her from her position. In other words, only 35% of Republicans voted to remove Liz Cheney. Now, another way to look at that is that is a stark number: 35% voting to remove one of their leaders just for calling out a president who called for violence and who, who basically stoked an insurrection that, which led to the, the sacking of the US Capitol and deaths, five people died, right? So, you know, it's a pretty stark divide, but that gives you a note that without the public eye, without the fear through which Donald Trump has, 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 has uh, wielded power for much of the last four years, the fear of being primary, the fear of losing, losing to this group, you know, it's about a third of the Republicans, you know, 35% who are hardcore Trumpists. Now, that's a problem for the Republican Party, right? Because they're already today a party that in the last four years has lost the presidency, they've lost the Senate, and they've lost the House. Uh, and, and to hope to take it back again without that third gives you the fundamental challenge they've got. At the same time, the actions of that third, as we've seen today, through the, the words of Marjorie Taylor Greene, fundamentally jeopardize their chances for the future because a large portion of America is rejecting that type of highly divisive, highly violent language. But again, going back to your question, the challenge we face is that you've got not a third of the country, but a third of the Republican Party, uh, you know, which are true believers, right? Who are hardcore Trumpists, who believe in the conspiracy theories of QAnon. Uh, and to the point that the, the you know, Department of Homeland Security and the US intelligence services this week came out with a very specific warning about the risks of, of, of right-wing terrorists. And so again, big shift in American politics. The, the US Super Bowl is coming up. Uh, the focus is not on Islamic terrorists, but it is also, it is on religious extremist terrorism. Right. This happens to be uh, you know, th those particular followers on the, the far right side of American politics. Um, Gordon, I'm just wondering, if you could, let's just see if we can quickly put you on the spot here and pivot to why, how does this affect Australia? Um, we'll get the foreign policy per se in a moment. But look, we've been talking about this now for 15 to 20 minutes. Um, just connect the dots for us. Um, I hope that's a softball question. Um, no, um, for, for an why should Australians care? I mean, it's, it's horrifying. It's a spectacle. We watch it. 
Um, you know, you and I are both U.S. citizens. Um, we um, or dual nationals. Um, we, um, you know, we react perhaps a little differently. But why should Australians? How does the how do those events um, start to cut across or have implications for Australian national interests? Well, look, on a broader picture, we're we're dealing with some fundamental questions about information, how you access information trust in institutions, trust in the news, uh, and, and the same channels of information which have led to that hardcore 35% of the Republican Party being conspiracy theorists, QAnon, hardcore Trumpists, also has an impact here in Australia. Uh, we, we read the same Facebook stories, they're, they're, they're spread through the exact same mechanisms, and there is an ideological affinity uh, that I think it has already impacted our politics today and had we had four more years, I think it would have been worse. And so in the short run, I think Australia has really dodged a bullet. Now, to step back and put that on a policy perspective, um, you know, look, um, I actually think Australia managed the Trump era better than any other US ally. Um, if you look at the early days when, when obviously uh, the government at that time, Prime Minister Trumbull, Foreign Minister Julie Bishop, et cetera, they had to fundamentally recalibrate Australia's position towards the U.S. due to an unexpected victory by Trump. Uh, and again, Australia was helped by the fact that we don't have a trade deficit with the United States. We have, we have a trade deficit, not a trade surplus, and we spend more than 2% of our, our defense budget, our, our budget on, on, our, on, on, uh, on defense. Uh, so we have always been kind of the gold star ally, but there was an awful lot of work done in the part of Australia to kind of calibrate that relationship. There has been a real spike in worry in the Australian media that somehow now, that we've got a conservative government in Australia and now a very progressive government in the US that we're gonna be out of sync. It's gonna have a negative impact on us. And I, I couldn't disagree more. Obviously there are gonna be issues that are gonna require kind of close coordination and there's gonna be some tensions. Climate change springs to mind immediately. The Biden administration has placed a high, high priority of clim on climate change and that will permeate almost every element from security policy to foreign policy to energy policy. So that's there. That's not a question. But the U.S.-Australia relationship has always been much stronger than an individual person, a la Donald Trump, or an individual issue like climate change. And the important thing is Biden's you know, first you know, two weeks has made pretty clear the full spectrum of areas where Australia and the U.S. can and will cooperate. Uh, there is a whole range of areas where the Trump administration was hostile to Australia's national interests. We are, at our core, supporters of the rules-based order. At our core, we're supporters of the, the liberal international system, institutions, standards, norms, and multilateralism. And all of those were kind of foreclosed because the Trump administration was hostile to them. Now, uh, again, on the full range of issues, whether it's health, the World Health Organization, or trade, or human rights, or you can go through the full spectrum, they're once again on the table. And so I'm pretty optimistic, uh, and we saw this from very early phone calls from the US Secretary of Defense and State to our, our Minister of Defense and Minister of Foreign Affairs here. Uh, just yesterday, uh, the phone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Morrison, really emphasizing the full spectrum of areas we're gonna work together. So I, I'm someone who is, is very optimistic about the impact of, of the transition in Washington on Australia and on Australia-US relations. Yeah, well, we'll, come, we'll get into a, f a few details on the foreign policy stuff uh, a little bit later. Time is, is, is rushing by. Um, Gordon, the other thing I feel is though you can't have a conversation about the United States. Um, you can't, <laughs> cannot be in a conversation well, has to be, pardon me, sorry, has to be in a conversation about the United States is, is COVID. Um, and, and the way I think we've got a pretty marked contrast now, certainly in rhetoric so far, and, in, and I think with every passing uh, week um, in, in policy substance, see the contrast between the Biden administration and the, and the Trump administration. Um, in his inauguration speech, Biden referred to this as a winter of peril, but also then he said, and opportunity. Um, the daily fatality counts out of the US, I mean, a good day is when it's below 2000, um, but there have been days 
you know, the day of the Capitol Hill riot, or at least the day afterwards, and that whole week leading up to, in the couple of weeks leading up to Biden's inauguration and the first week of his presidency, over 4,000 people a day um, passing away uh, from COVID or COVID-related uh, illnesses in the United States. Um, I'm wondering, Gordon, you know, your thinking about the importance of COVID, both <laughs> substantively as a, as a, as a, as a real thing for the United States to be confronting the sort of the steps the Biden administration is taking and perhaps some of the political consequences as well. Just, you know, um, thinking about, you know, I've got my own assessment about that, but maybe I'll let you uh, fire away on some reflections yeah. on, on that. Um, as of today, the rolling seven day average uh, of fatalities in the US is still over 3000 a day, which is just stunning to look at it from an Australian perspective where we mm -hmm. haven't had mm -hmm since December. Uh, we're a little bit humbled here in Western Australia. We've been pretty smug for the last 10 months without a case, but I think you know that we had our first case to, in, over the weekend uh, in 10 months and we, we had a quick lockdown for a week and fingers and toes crossed that will be lifted uh, uh, later on today. Um, but having said that, it does provide me with a unique perspective look back at my homeland. I have mid 80 year old parents who mercifully were just vaccinated today the rollout of the vaccines has been quite remarkable. As of today, there are about 28.5 million vaccinations that have taken place. That accounts for about 22% of the prioritized population, about 8.2% of the overall population. So a long ways to go. Uh, there is some optimism now that, you know, combination of the change of the weather, uh, the combination of, 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 of people wearing masks with the new mask mandate, the fact that actually, <laughs> We, we have transparency, you know, that, that Anthony Fauci can talk every day and, and, and use science without having to think about, you know, what the political implications of his commenta commentary is, uh, are all very kind of helpful on that front. So I think there is a that the rate of daily infections will continue to, to drop, uh, and then it will accelerate in its, its decline once the impact of vaccinations comes in. There's just been several really encouraging studies this week that show that the vaccination itself does help impede uh, the spread, not just you know the, the, whether, you, whether or not you contract the illness. Uh, so again, stark difference between us here in Australia, but no, relative no. to the trajectory the United States was on, a positive one. Um, I do actually have a question for you on domestic politics, yeah. but your take on COVID first. He has said it's time now for national policy research. That was in his... Um inauguration speech too. Finally, there will be a national response um, to this issue. Uh, he's put Fauci front and centre. He's put hard numbers up there, 100 million vaccinations in the first 100 days. Um, the single biggest piece of legislation, uh, I think that this Congress um, will, will deal with over its two years, and we're only at the start of its two year uh, term, is this COVID relief package, um, uh, the, the, the proposal for 1.9 trillion, how, how quickly and the, the final form of that legislation and its success in sort of delivering relief to American households and firms and state and local governments um, and, and sort of the medium to longer term impact of that. I think you put that plus the vaccination program together they will define whether the Biden presidency is a success or a failure. I think, I think everything is going to pivot off these first six, perhaps to nine months um, in, in arresting, you know, dragging the COVID pandemic t to ground and, and getting the economy uh, firing. Uh, if this huge stimulus um, 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 goes through, um, and it kind of has to, because I think, again, from, from Biden's perspective, um, politically, but I also think in terms of, you know, jolting, uh, you know, completing the recovery, sort of it's a sort of a stalled recovery, economic recovery in the United States from, from COVID as, as right now in the middle of a winter where the, the, the public health crisis is probably at its most dire um, I just think the stakes couldn't be higher for Biden politically uh, and, and perhaps for the United States uh, 
<laughs> materially, substantively. Um, I think the, what follows from that, the politics around it, um, the way votes are being set up, Democrats control the uh, majorities in both um, Senate and House in terms of the agenda setting power. And, uh, and if Republicans want to vote against this stuff, yeah, sure, have, have, bring those amendments and go on the record and let's find out, particularly perhaps the, to being quite political opportunistic about it, Gordon, uh, exploiting some of those differences you were alluding to earlier, drawing attention to, I think, a, a pretty vivid and stark cleavage among Republicans right now. But, but, and, and that's all to do more about congressional politics, looking ahead to the 22 midterms. But certainly, I think US domestic politics, once we get this impeachment trial behind us, uh, is, is, is going to be all about uh, COVID, the response to it, political ownership of success or failure um, with respect to this, these incredibly ambitious, but necessarily so, uh, targets um, um, that the Biden administration has, has put out there. No, you're spot on. Well, hey, look, I realize we've got a lot of questions uh, and you've got other questions yourself, but, but I want to take advantage of the, of the opportunity to do a little bit more analytical thinking rather than just reporting on the events of the day, because uh, with your 20 years at Stanford, uh, your tenure now at the United States Study Center, there's few people in the U.S., uh, let alone in Australia, that, that, that um, have your intensity of focus on the voting process in the United States. <laughs> yes. uh, and it seems to me that there's a bit of a tension between two things that have happened. So in my home state of Arizona, clearly in the state of Georgia, uh, there was this tremendous voter organization, get out the vote organization, yep. Stacey Abrams and other Georgia, that really turned the tide. It made the difference, right? And that was competing with well documented, it, and again, you've testified before you know, the Supreme Court or various states on efforts to gerrymander districts yep. uh, to, to restrict voting. So mm -hmm. I, I've seen recent reporting that in the event, in the, in the response to what's happened in, in Georgia, that Republican legislators across the country are scrambling now to intensify their efforts at yep. voter suppression. You know, they're, they're trying to kind of react. And I, I'm curious as to your take, um, as to how that is playing out now and how that will play out between now and the midterms uh, two years from now, because that seems to be the ground game where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, no, uh, it's a great issue to put on the table, Gordon. And indeed, I'd point out that the first bill on the House of Representatives agenda, HR1, uh, House of Representatives bill number one of this current Congress um, is, is a sweeping piece of legislation um, uh, proposing lots of money, federal money, for um, universally uh, across states and, and local government, um, increasing access to the polls, simplifying and unifying, uh, 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 imposing some uniformity on uh, vote by mail procedures, uh, vote by mail procedures. Um, um, the, the, the carrot, if you will, to try and get Republicans on board is money uh, for state governments, uh, some of whom are Republican, but, but, but ballot security as well. Um, is sort of the, 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 the political frame to try and get that through. But, but, you, but the bigger issue and the way you framed it, Gordon, is correct. It, look, it, it's an uncomfortable fact, but there's one side of American politics that is interested in seeing fewer people vote. And, and, and that's a, in a way that I think is very, it's very confronting for Australians uh, and you know, conservative friends in Australia to have to understand that about their American you know, conservative cousins, as it were, um, that, 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 a, that one side of American politics is frankly fearful of, um, of what happens um, if, as voter turnout goes up, because recent history uh, shows that in some, particularly in swing jurisdictions, as, as more people vote, um, there are more unmobilized Democrats out there than there are unmobilized Republicans. Um, and, uh, and that in general, um, I think the last couple of cycles have shown that um, um, as turnout goes up, um, Democratic candidates tend to do better 
And we're back to an old story in American politics. Look at the battleground states on this. Um, and it's the states of the former Confederacy, but now throwing throw in a few um, surprising, you know, states, you know, it's Minnesotas and Wisconsin's and Michigan's as well. Um, um, Ohio, uh, Missouri as, as well with some border states in the Civil War, but 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 it is a battle that is overlaid on long standing cleavages around race and inequality that have legacies going back right back to the Civil War. And, and I think a stark reminder for Australians that the, the, the fight, and it is a fight, um, for a, a truly inclusive citizenship um is, is not finished in the united states um, um it is a struggle um that goes on um and 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 the other the only other observation i'd make gordon is that don't underestimate the power of trump as a mobilizing factor for dems um you know you mentioned earlier that under donald trump republicans lost the white house the senate and and the house of representatives um um, Trump himself was just perhaps the best turn out the vote, <laughs> get out the vote uh, agent that Democrats could hope for as much as he mobilized people on his own side. And the first insight we got into that was the 2018 midterm elections, which produced century high turnout in the midterm elections. Record numbers of Republicans turned out, but they were overwhelmed by the response from Democrats. And, and a similar thing happened in the presidential election in 2020, that when turnout goes through the stratosphere, um, Democrats kind of win that turnout drag race and indeed won it. And again, now we have to get down to a local level and focus on the, I think Stacey Abrams, just a political phenom. Uh, mm. what, what's happened in the state of Georgia uh, is just, just remarkable. Um, um, uh, I think it brought forward something people thought might have been in the offing 10 to 20 years from now to bring it forward to 2020 that it, that it has narrowly voted Democratic in a presidential election and its two Senate seats have flipped. Uh, it's just it's, it's a remarkable political development. Um, and, and I think it, and it just points back to this very stark question um, confronting Republicans. And so do you double down on the strategies that were kind of working uh, through suppressing the vote? Or is it time to sort of wake up and, and look ahead um, to, to a changed America, uh, one where um, the, the electorate that has been our core for a long time needs to grow uh, uh, because oh. it's becoming increasingly infeasible to, to win through. So if they say... Turnout. Yeah. We, we, we long had the axiom that demography is destiny. Um, yeah. and, and after the 2008 loss uh, under John McCain, the Republican Party got together and said, hey, look, we can't win a national election unless we, we have a platform and, and positions and, and, and politics that is more appealing to women and minorities. Uh, and then after the 2012 loss under Mitt Romney, they had the exact same kind of yeah. force of rhetoric. And instead, they went the exact opposite direction with Donald Trump. Uh, and to his credit, I guess you can use the word credit, you know, he actually, for the first time in 50 years, bumped up the percentage of the overall electorate that was, that was yeah. Anglo, that was, was white. Um, and, and, and he can rightly claim that in 2020, he actually got even more votes. I mean, 74 million Americans came out to vote for that. Uh, but it really is a tension in the contest because you rightly pointed out that 81 came out and voted for Joe Biden. Uh, so it, 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 the level of voter participation was something remarkable. Yeah. Um, one thing we haven't mentioned yet, which is just stunning to me, is Twitter. Uh, I've just, yeah. the, the last month has been serenely quiet because of that, of the president being banned for Twitter. Uh, and yeah. I have to wonder how the current debate in, in the House and the Senate, you know, to have Mitch McConnell. Uh, the, 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 the now minority leader of the Senate come out and call Marjorie Taylor Greene a cancer on the Republican Party and Looney, you know, it, whether these things would, would, it would be still taking place if the president was dominating the airspace. Um, the only thing we've heard from the president in the last 48 hours is he has withdrawn his membership from the Screen Actors Guild, and he did so on a letter which, against the law, used the seal of the United States. 
in which he signed President Donald J. Trump. And so, and so uh, there are some issues that will be coming up in the, in the impeachment uh, next week, uh, uh, which are tied to the unique personality and character of the former yeah. president. Yeah. Hey, Gordon, I'm wondering at um, uh, 35 minutes in, quickly, let's touch on um, let's let's do a quick pivot to um, to, to foreign policy. Um, um, uh, one thing um, that I think a lot of us who pay close attention to the appointments um, will will be aware of is that this is a team of national security advisors and foreign policy advisors around Biden uh, that have a lot of ties to Australia. Um, Australia is sort of on the radar uh, for these people. I'm wondering, again, you have some close ties to some of these people at an individual level, Gordon. Could you just perhaps mention a few names and their histories and why I think the Australian foreign policy and defence establishment is actually feeling pretty comfortable, pretty reassured um, by their opposite, who, who are their opposite numbers in, in this Biden administration? Shortly after the inauguration of President Trump four years ago, I wrote a short article called, you know, Follow the People. Uh, yeah. My apologies to the follow the money crowd, because in the end, the administrations are staffed by people. They're the ones who have policies and ideas and vision. Uh, and, and rightly, a heavy focus has been placed on the Biden cabinet. As of today, six members of his cabinet have been confirmed by the Senate. Uh, there are another 13 that have been nominated that haven't been considered, and another 31 that are in the process of Senate hearings right now. So a little bit slower than normal, but it's a strange time uh, in, in terms of getting the cabinet up and running. As you mentioned, every one of them are people who are kind of known and respected on a bipartisan basis, uh, and, and almost every one of them have deep and long-standing relationships to Australia. So you're absolutely correct. There's a sense of familiarity, a sense of, of relief, if, if you will. Um, it's important to note that you know, the Trump administration had a very difficult challenge and that the, the majority, uh, the overwhelming majority of the Republican foreign policy establishment in Washington, D.C., these are the people who normally fill these, these political appointee positions, had signed on to never Trump letters. And so they weren't available. Uh, and so Trump never, never in the course of four years filled, I don't think he ever got more than 70% of his senior Senate confirmed political appointee positions filled. They mostly stayed yeah. there. Um, and Joe Biden on his first day conducted a Zoom video call uh, where he virtually swore in a thousand political appointees. These yeah. are mostly junior ones who didn't require Senate confirmation so they could just yeah. swear that in. Uh, and, and then also those who are in the office of the White House itself that don't require Senate confirmation. So Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, very early on, even before the inauguration, said some very strongly supportive words about Australia as we were suffering under direct Chinese pressure. Um, then to the immense relief, not just of Australia, but the region writ large, Kurt Campbell, former Assistant Secretary of State, uh, was appointed as an Indo-Pacific czar. You know, it's a yep. great terminology, maybe the one element of Russia that's left over from the last administration, <laughs> I'm not sure, but we keep the term czar. Um, uh, but again, uh, Secretary Austin in defense is actually less known. Uh, Tony Blinken at the Department of State, extremely well known. Janet Yellen at, at, at the Treasury Department, extremely well known. Avril Haines at the CIA, extremely well known, or the, the Director of National Intelligence, rather. So I, I think there is a tremendous sense of relief. I would also point our viewers today, uh, President Biden went to the State Department to deliver yeah. his first foreign policy speech. And, and the, the location is really important. Uh, President Trump viewed career diplomats as the enemy, as the deep state. Um, and, and candidly, there was opposition among career diplomats to a, an approach which was very undiplomatic, you might imagine, right? Um, having said that, I think the Biden speech location was a signal that he trusts you know, the, the expertise of the career diplomatic community. Uh, and the, the overall theme of the speech was America is back. Now, obviously, given, given the difficulties of the last year, particularly in alliance relationships, uh, there's a lot of hard work to be done. But I, I've yet to see a, an assessment of the speech that didn't find it exactly the words that allies like Australia or Japan or NATO were, were looking to hear 
a very full-throated defense of America's role in the world for America's own interests as well as the interests of the world. So that's something that I would I would urge our, our viewers to, to look at carefully. Good speech. Yeah, yeah uh, well said. And, and key thing, uh, we'll get into this in future calls, but as the shape of a, of a comprehensive, um, frankly, we'll call it a China policy, but an Indo-Pacific strategy, um, starts to emerge from the Biden administration. It's integration with elements of domestic policy in the US, build back better, uh, for instance, um, uh, infrastructure investments in um, government-led um, investments in, in strategic industries, implications for Australia and, and opportunities for Australia and, and risks to Australia um, in some cases um, through all of that. that. That's obviously material, Gordon, and I will be exploring with um, um, interlocutors from Washington and the United States in, in the months to come, but something where, where both, both of our centers are, are like intensely tracking um, perhaps um, the single biggest point of differentiation when it comes to prosecution of a China policy, if you will, between the Trump administration and the Biden administration, um, one in which allies figure way more prominently. And I think giving voice uh, to the aspiration that I think people around Trump were, were trying to get going, and that is a, a truly integrated uh, approach to dealing with this huge challenge, uh, integrating elements of what you're doing domestically uh, with, with the foreign policy uh, end states you're looking to, to bring about uh, in concert with allies. Um, Gordon, let's, um, let's turn to some questions um, because we've got a ton. So many people signed up. It's our first webinar for the year. Got a ton of great questions. Um, um, Josh Bahari from, um, from Pfizer Australia um, asks, um, could a future Republican-led Congress overturn a decision by this current Congress um, to ban, if, if that current Congress were to ban Trump from ever running for federal office again? So the short answer is we do not know. Um, at <laughs> one, um, it's not clear that the president will be impeached. In fact, it seems unlikely. Uh, there was a We're test yeah. on the constitutionality of impeaching a former president. Uh, and again, there's some controversy here, right? As you, you will recall, that immediately after the events of the 6th of January, uh, when there was pressure uh, to impeach the president and hold the trial before the inauguration to remove him then, uh, Mitch McConnell, then still the Senate Majority Leader, said, no, there's not enough time. We can't do this while he's still president. Let's do it afterwards. And then predictably, after the election, uh, Mitch McConnell voted with those that says, well, we can't vote him after, uh, after the election because he's already gone. And, and the primary purpose of impeachment uh, is constitutionally to remove someone from office. Um, they're going ahead with the trial. I think the real fear on the part of the Republican Party is that uh, if there's a trial where there are witnesses called and it's open and transparent, the sheer evidence that's going to come out is going to make it increasingly difficult for them. Because there is a lot of unanswered questions about the, the 6th of January. You know, yeah. the, 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 why, did, why was the Capitol Police force unprepared? Why did they not get the National Guard called in? Why was there only, you know, with a crowd of, of tens of thousands uh, of, of, of insurrectionists, as we can call them, that marching on the Capitol. Why were there only 1,200 police officers there? What was the communication from them in the White House? And as that comes out with the power of a subpoena, it's going to be an interesting period of time. Uh, but even then, obviously, the president is gone. Impeachment would have the effect, potentially, if successful, of preventing the president to run for office again. I don't think an executive order by a future Rep Republican president could do that. Uh, it's untested and legal waters completely as to whether or not a uh, future Republican Senate would, would want to do that either. But a lot depends on how things play out. Yeah, you know, and, and a lot depends on you know, the future of the Republican Party. You know, which direction do they take? Do they take the decision that some have taken to try to purge the Trumpist element of them and rebuild on core conservative principles? Or do they remain the party of Donald J. Trump? And, and as you see, that debate is taking place this week uh, and it's not conclusive in any way. Yeah. Hey, um, um, let's, we've got a question here. Um, oh, that essentially also, look, I'm going to bundle here because there's so many questions and time is tight, but 
But Laura Jays from Sky um, asked, how does the Republican Party move on from Trump? Was Trump an aberration or the new normal? Um, I, I think that's exactly what we're finding out, Laura, uh, over, over this today's votes. Uh, and Gordon drew attention to the fact that a secret ballot uh, broke two thirds for keeping Liz Cheney in her position, whereas an open vote on the floor of the House of Representatives to strip um, Marjorie Taylor Greene of her committee seats only got 11 Republicans uh, in favour and 10 Republicans voted uh, for impeachment. Um, I think there's, expect plenty more votes like that. I think where Democrats will delight, frankly, in beating up their Republican uh, counterparts with votes that expose this, this sore um, um, inside the Republican Party, with impeachment, I think, being perhaps sort of the, the most dramatic instantiation of that. Uh, um, uh, and, you, you know, the Senate, during the trial, the Senate will vote repeatedly on whether to call this witness or that. Even those votes, the procedural votes through the course of the impeachment, they're all going to be so fraught. Um, so there's an underlying issue here, which is really important, and I think we've forgotten about it for the last four years, and that is the, the cleansing power of daylight, of transparency. Uh, for the last four years, uh, and again, I'm, I'm being blunt here, the Trump administration abused the power of the presidency to cover up its, its own transgressions. And so uh, we, we didn't see a lot of those. But again, there's that old adage that the wheels of justice grind exceedingly slow, but they grind exceedingly fine. This issue is not over. You know, those issues yeah. are outstanding. They're ongoing. Uh, and, and now that the, the, the Democrats control the House, the Senate, uh, and the presidency, and there's various investigative organs of government, I think you're going to see a lot more information out there which is gonna make it more difficult for those issues to kind of be swept under the rug going forward. Um, and, and so for those who say uh, impeachment is, is, um, is irrelevant, we already know that the Republicans are gonna let him off, that you're not gonna get two thirds. Now that's not the issue. The issue is transparency. The issue is information. And I think we're gonna see that uh, in, the, in the coming days and weeks. We're, we're um, 11 minutes away. Um, so let's get through some of the foreign policy questions. We've got really super questions here. Uh, Trevor Rowe from Rothschild Australia asks, um, does Australia have an opportunity to deal with our China problem via any quote, grand deal the Biden administration might uh, ink with China, say with climate change and trade being being fused? Short answer is no, there, there is no grand deal. Um, I, I anticipate that the, the Biden approach to China will be more nuanced, as you might anticipate. It will be done in, in much closer coordination with allies like Australia, uh, and it, as such will be more effective. But uh, you know, the, the world has shifted, and, and most importantly, China has shifted. Uh, and so often our debate here in Australia tends to think in a self-flagellating way that somehow we're the problem, that we did things wrong, and if only we had said something slightly differently or at a different time, then things would be fine. When the reality is, if you look at Canada and the UK and Germany and Japan and, and, and India, they've all got the same fundamental challenges with the more aggressive approach under President Xi Jinping in China. Uh, and, and there is a complete and total awareness of that, of the incoming and Biden team. So again, there's not gonna be a grand bargain. There's not space for a grand bargain. What there is space for is cooperation. Now on the positive side, you know, my colleague, Jeff Wilson, who's our director of research and has you know, been nonstop on China, uh, probably not by desire, but by necessity, given his work on trade for the last six months, is of the opinion that out of concern for uh, a more effective approach out of Washington, DC, China is already calibrating its approach to Australia. So, you know, after the you know, last six months where China has been ratcheting up nonstop, if you look at post-inauguration, China's been pretty careful. And again, part of that is something I mentioned earlier, to have a clarion statement come out from Jake Sullivan, the then appointed national security advisor to say, this shall not stand, we've got Australia's back, means that that's ultimately something that's in Australia's interest. We're not alone in this. 
and you, you've seen moves today in the UK, I think you're gonna see that across the board. A more coordinated approach is better for Australia, and a more coordinated approach counterintuitively is also better for China. Interesting, Gordon. Something we'll be coming back to, no doubt. I think it's the single biggest issue. No question. Uh, um, in, in, in the foreign policy constellation. Um, Gordon, you'll remember, we've got a, a question uh, from someone who's just identifying as a community representative of the, of the uh, representative of the Uyghur community. Um, how does the declaration of Uyghur genocide affect US-China relations? Uh, what are the implications for Australia? So this is, is one of the reasons I gave the answer I gave to the previous question. Uh, the notion that there's gonna be a grand bargain when there are very real and unignorable issues surrounding Taiwan, surrounding Hong Kong, and surrounding the Uyghurs. So the fact that the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, has stated repeatedly now since his, his swearing in uh, that his own view that the Chinese treatment of the Uyghur population in Western China is tantamount to genocide. That, that fundamentally frames the parameters of the policy in the discussion. Uh, and it's one that, to be honest, Australia has been a little bit more careful about, mm -hmm. um, understandably, but that, that's gonna be a big issue. Uh, and, and it's not gonna limit, be limited just to Chinese borders. Uh, a lot of the questions that came into us were about what's going on in Burma, and I won't claim to be an expert in Burma, but even what happens in Burma has to be viewed in the context of that broader question of China and China's role. Because uh, 10 years ago, when Aung San Suu Kyi was elected and out, led out of house arrest, that was widely seen as Burma or Myanmar distancing itself, distancing itself from China. There's no question that the, the reassertion of military control through a coup d'etat by the military is done with the blessing of China and is seen as, as a recalibration of Burma moving back more closely to China. In fact, the fact that China came out shortly after the coup and announced it as a significant cabinet reshuffle tells you everything you think you need to know. Sure, sure. Um, just on Blinken, I'd commend to um, everybody uh, an interview he gave um, with NBC News um, and we linked to it, I believe, the US Study Center linked to it in our latest edition of our newsletter, the, the, uh, the 46th, uh, previously known as the 45th, but we're up to, uh, Biden is the 46th president of the United States. But anyway, in that interview, what was really interesting about it, Gordon, was this explicit linking of what the United States needs to be doing internationally with what it needs to be doing domestically um, and, and linking of Build Back Better, the, 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 the name, the slogan for this program for revitalization of the American economy and investments in, in strategic uh, sectors um, as a way of addressing sort of weaknesses um, in America's ability to project power um, uh, abroad. I thought it was really interesting by a new Secretary of State to, to, to be that clear. And I think it's a big, big element of Biden administration thinking uh, about the way to project power means to, to build it at home, number one, but not just in things like, say, technologies, uh, strategically important technologies and whatnot, but democracy uh, uh, and, and the robustness of American, uh, not just political institutions, but institutions more broadly and civil society as well. Um, really, really a far-sighted and very comprehensive uh, statement. Also real nuance on China. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, we compete and have an adversarial relationship as the US uh, with China. Um, um, then there are things in the middle and then there are things on which we're looking to cooperate with China. So yeah, I agree with you, a sort of a grand bargain where I think uh, climate change and trade and, uh, and perhaps some even some security issues are all sort of linked together in some, I think that's a, a bridge too far. I, 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 and I don't know that, you know, well, I think, I think that's that death made, by a thousand cuts and opening yourself up to be- Can I make this a little bit more, a little, a little bit more explicit? 
the, the grand bargain verbiage implies kind of a G2 world where China and the US yeah. get together and make their deal and they solve the world. And, and that's clearly not the way Anthony Blinken thinks about the world. No, that's and, right. That's and judged right. by the same things coming out in the president's speech today, that's not the way he views the world. No. They understand, rightly, I believe, that the real source of American power isn't just the strength of the US military or the strength of the US economy. Although they do recognize that you know, American democratic institutions in America's economy have to be strong for the American to project power. But the real strength of the US is the systems it built after the world, the Second World yeah, War. Yeah. The international, as we in Australia refer to it, rules-based order. Uh, the alliances the United States has around the world. Uh, and unfortunately, while every country in the world, of course, prioritizes its own national interests, a U.S. policy which articulated America first almost always meant America alone because it was highly transactional. It didn't leverage alliances. It didn't leverage values. It didn't leverage institutions, standards, and norms, uh, which were all in the advantage, not just of the United States, but of the system. And so the Biden speech today, that I found, the part of that, that I found most, most uh, informative was that underlying conclusion that we do this not just because it's good for the international system, but because it is good for what he described as our naked self-interest. But to be able to articulate the naked self-interest of Australia and the United States, both re residing in that international system of standards, norms, institutions, agreements, laws, you know, the rules-based order, is a welcome departure from the last four years. And I think that's why it's been so well received uh, in Canberra and elsewhere. Yep. Well said, Gordon. Nice summary. And, 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 and truth be told, Biden's speech today at the State Department is probably what you should be referring to before going back to Blinken's interview from three or four days ago. Incredibly significant that an incoming president goes to the State Department um, for, for a speech his Although, yeah, just yeah. I know we're out of time, but you know, what, what are the games in, in, in Washington, D.C. that I, I spent 25 years there in my colleagues from Japan or Korea yeah. or South Asia or even Australia were always really keen to figure out in the State of the Union where they mentioned, right? That was just the game. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I've spent a good chunk of my career working on North Korea, and it was quite remarkable that, that North Korea did not get a mention in, in the great big foreign policy speech. So you might imagine in my circles, that's, that's all the Twitter today. So yeah, right, <laughs> right. Out. Um, um, lots of, so many questions here. Uh, thank you everybody who's sending questions. I've tried to sort of touch on the themes at least. Gordon, real, we're, we're down to 60 seconds and there's a bunch of questions here and it's something that's increasingly on our radar at the US Study Center. And, and question we've been asked ever since you know, before Biden was elected. Um, and that is, is climate change potentially a wedge issue between the two governments, the Australian and the US government? Um, is that Australia perhaps finds itself, you know, and you know, I'm, I don't necessarily agree with this characterization, a climate laggard, um, you know, that's the critique that's out there. Uh, just your thoughts on that argument um, and, and that, that sort of set of concerns? There is no question that Australia is going to have to recalibrate its position and, and its, 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 its phrasing, at least, you know, how it characterizes its approach on climate change to match a new world. And it's not just the United States. Remember, uh, Australia was, was given a lot of cover because the United States was so much out of kilter with the world order, right? But now that the Biden administration almost day one, actually on day one, on returned day one. To the Paris Climate Accords, right? The fact that they made it clear from the intelligence community from the defense community, from the energy community, every one of those that climate change is a major priority uh, means that, that that will permeate the relationship. Uh, but again, I have no doubt that Australia is capable of doing that. Um, and, and that will become an area of, of collaboration and communication. We're gonna have to you know, deal with our own domestic politics here as well, I get that. Uh, but in the big picture, you, know, you mentioned it spot on. The, the priority for the Biden administration is going to be COVID, COVID, COVID. And then once you get beyond that, they're going to be focusing on economic recovery. <laughs> then they've got these big picture foreign policy issues to deal with. But the notion that the Biden administration is sitting down together and saying, all right, those Aussies are a real problem on climate change. <laughs> yeah. That's our number one priority to get Australia back in line. Kind of misses the context we're in right now. Yes, we yeah. have to calibrate, but I'm actually much more optimistic 
about the environment we face going forward. Yeah, and my own assessment is similar to that. The only other thing I'd add in, in the closing seconds here is that I'm actually less, uh, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic about uh, climate change, um, much change on climate change uh, because of the, the, the very delicate balance of power in the US Congress at the moment. I, I, I think to the extent Biden can move there, it'll be through executive orders and things he can do off his own desk and, and perhaps signing up for international agreements. But the, there isn't going to be much political appetite in, in this Congress where the Democrats only have a six seat majority um, in, in the House of Representatives for, for anything particularly bold, if anything at all, frankly. And, um, and I think over time that might take some of the, so, some of the sort of a sturm and drang on that issue um, away, as I think the world sort of wakes up to, to the reality that ah, um, the US is sort of doing some things, um, but perhaps not as much as, as they were talking about during the campaign, just because of where Congress is, the composition of Congress and um, that's, whether it's solar or hydrogen, we've got an awful lot to solve that narrative too. It's just a matter of us pivoting towards that. Hey, yeah, before well, you give the final words, I'm just saying we're really looking forward to hosting next month. So I get to turn the tables and ask you the questions. Uh, I'll work together with Simon to, to have a guest join us as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Simon, for for thank you. And, and that's, that's that's good enough for final words, Gordon. And and we're out of time. Thanks to everybody that joined us. Um, um, again, it's a crowded, crowded agenda in Washington at the moment. We, we could have easily done an hour politics and an hour policy, um, but we'll come back uh, in a month from now, as Gordon said, with a guest from Washington as the who's in the administration and perhaps who isn't um, gets a little clearer and, um, and lining up guests gets perhaps a little easier uh, as, as, the, as the deck chairs uh, uh, I rearranged the, 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 the musical chairs, uh, ends at least round one.